Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you love us and that you love on us during worship, God, and you give us the opportunity to love you back. And Father, we just recognize right now the ministry of the word is worship. And many times, Lord, when Paul and, and Peter preached in the book of Acts, the spirit would fall on people just during the preaching of the word. We pray that same thing would happen today, God, that my words would be sharp and effective in declaring your goodness and that our hearts and our ears would be open and tender to receive your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we've been talking, I've been talking about prospering in God. And of course, when we say prospering, we're not talking about accumulating stuff, right? We're, we're saying we're, we're going to be successful, fruitful, and abundant in what he's called us to. Many times when we prosper, stuff's, we, we, we sort of end up with stuff, but the point of prospering is not what you have, but what you're called to do and your obedience in being successful in that, right? And just to recap, because I think this is so important, I want to I want to uh, knock anything out of you that would get you to believe that God does not want you to prosper according to his plan for your life. I want to break it out of, I just want to, I don't know what to say, I just want you to believe this because it's, so it's so important for my own life that I, I believe God wants me to prosper, that he wants to make me exceedingly fruitful, Right? Sometimes I want to quit. Sometimes I want to give up. Sometimes my circumstances don't feel like they make sense. But God remains faithful. His love remains the same. He has called me to prosper according to his will. And we're just going to recap in Genesis 17. Abram, who becomes Abraham, is standing with the Lord in this wonderful encounter. How old was he? He was 99. Come on, guys. We've done it for two weeks now. He was 99 years old. So what does that mean? You've not aged out of the blessing, right? And not a one of us here is 100. I know that for a fact. So you still got time. You still got time for, for God to do all he wants to do in your life, despite how you feel, right? And Abraham is before the Lord, and God meets him on his, in the 99th year of his life to give him the covenant that God will make him exceedingly fruitful and that this covenant would be passed down to generations and generations and generations and generations that we would be kings before the Lord according to his will. Amen. So we get to inherit that, that promise. And then in Romans 4, what, what does Paul write about to the Romans church? He's talking about why God chose Abraham. Why did God chose, choose Abraham? Was it because he was the perfect candidate? No, he was a total scoundrel in a lot of ways. What did he do? He, he left his wife, uh, he, he hung her out to dry. He gave her to pagan kings. He, he, he just wasn't really the greatest guy. Why, why, did, why did God choose Abraham if he wasn't perfect? Because it's not about Abraham. It's about God, right? God chose Abraham because he believed. Believed. In fact, what you believe shapes what you experience. What you believe shapes what you experience. It's actually more important to know that your belief system shapes what you experience, not what is inside of you. Amen? Your brokenness has, has very little to do with what God wants to do in your life. Sometimes it gets in the way, but it's not the final word. Jesus' blood is. Amen? What we believe about God actually shapes our destiny much more than what we know about ourselves. Let me say it like that. This is why it's important that we have to understand that God has made a choice. God has made a choice. And what's his choice? To make you exceedingly fruitful. To make you exceedingly fruitful. Let me ask you a question. That's what I want to talk about today is the power of choice. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt like you weren't chosen to be blessed by God? Probably. You probably have, right? Like you've, you look at your, your situation, your circumstances, and you think, well, maybe he wants to bless some people more than me. Or maybe uh, if you've fallen into really bad doctrine, maybe you've thought he hasn't chosen you altogether, right? And, and I know that everybody has to struggle with that question 
at some point in their faith walk, has God chosen me? What I want to address today is that God has chosen you. Predestination is real, but only in the, in the reality that God has predestined you to experience his love. Right? There's a lot of bad teaching, bad doctrine out there that says that God only choose, chooses some, and the other ones are disqualified because they're, they're not chosen according to his will. God has chosen you. He has predestined you. He has decided already that you belong to his great love covenant. Now you have to choose to believe that. Now you have to choose, okay? So I want to talk about the power of choice. I want to talk about the power of choice. And I've got a lot of... Okay, can you hear me? I got more bass. Sound good. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> this is a fancier microphone. Okay, so I want to talk about the power of choice. I like this a lot better. I feel like I don't have to yell. All right, what's the one characteristic God put in us when he created us that's different from all the rest of creation? Well, free will is a gift he gave us, but what's the, the ingrained characteristic? And we're going to get to free will, so that was a good answer. You win a cookie. What's, what's the characteristic when he made us? We were made in his image. Ding, ding, ding. You were made in God's image. All the other parts of creation don't carry that characteristic. You were made in God's image. In Genesis 1, verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make human beings... In our image to be like us. Who's the hour in that sentence? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, which is mind blowing that the, the perfect triune God was just fully content in all of eternity because God is the Alpha and the Omega. There's no beginning or end to who He is. He's always been, He's always existed, He's always been present. And they're just hanging out, this perfect relationship Father, Son, Holy Spirit, enjoying each other. Uh, full of pleasure about who they are and they have a thought that comes in to the timeline of eternity. And what's that thought? I want to make human beings and I want to make them in my image. But it's important to understand it doesn't stop there. It says in our image to be like us. That's the free will part, right? So not only are you made in God's image, not only do you carry the characteristic of of looking like God to reveal his glory on the earth. He has made you like him. And what is God? He's free. He's love. He's free. So therefore, if we are to be like him, we ourselves have to be created to be free. And what does freedom look like? Free will. A choice. You have the choice to choose what you desire most. And for some of us, it's kind of scary we don't like that. We don't like that freedom. We want other people to choose for us. Some of us are discovering the freedom in that. But whether you realize it or not, you actually have a choice to choose what you desire. So God, verse 27 says, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Only two options, folks, male and female. Just got to say that over and over again. Only two options, male and female. In his image, to be like them. So God made us in his image so that we could have relationship with him, but so that we can also act like him on the earth he gave us to steward, right? So we actually have the capacity to make choices based on what we desire. But how many of you know that every choice comes with a consequence, right? Some of us are still learning that. I am. Like I, every day I, I realize I like the ability to choose what I want, but I forget that my choices are attached to a consequence that comes thereafter. Amen? And, and sometimes breaking addiction just looks like learning to make better choices. <laughs> so if you're sitting here today and you're like, I can't break this off of my life, it's probably because you've not learned how to choose something that's better. Amen? So your choice has a consequence. The consequence is that it either draws you closer to God or draws you further away from God. 
right? Your choices, no matter how big or small they are, they either grow you in intimacy with him and his provision, his protection, his safety, relationship with him, or draw you away from relationship with him where you're more dependent on yourself, your own protection, your own provision, your own safety, the things that you can do. And even though you don't feel like it all the time, all the choices you make affect the outcome of your life and have impact on the people you're called to do relationship with. Oof. That's the hard part, right? It's like, well, why can't I just do this? It doesn't hurt anybody else. It actually does. Spiritually, there's a ripple effect. So let's look at the first bad choice ever recorded in human history. Can anybody guess what chapter of Genesis we're going to go to? Chapter 3. The first terrible choice ever recorded in human history. We don't know if they made any bad choices before this, but this is the first one that was recorded. It's Genesis 3, verse 1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the fruit of any of these trees in the garden? Verse 2, of course we may eat fruit from all the, tre from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Verse 4, the serpent said, oh, you won't die. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. Verse 6, six the woman was convinced she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were open and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Okay. So here we are in the garden. Adam and Eve are in perfect relationship with God. They have everything they need and they can't exhaust the richness of God's provision in their lives, can they? They got all the trees they could ever eat from. There's only uh, two trees in the middle of the garden, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Which one are they not allowed to eat from? All right, the good knowledge tree. So how does all this mess start? With temptation. What is temptation? It's a challenge to what you desire, right? Right? So Satan's not actually putting sin in you. He's just calling the sin out of you that's already there. <laughs> that was a hard word. <laughs> Satan is actually revealing to you through temptation, to at Eve through temptation, the desire that's already there. And then what happens? She makes a very ill-informed choice, doesn't she? And that choice affects all the generations that come out of her for the rest of human history. The whole world falls. Everybody's sick in their sin. And now humanity is destined to die because of one choice that was made. However many years ago it was, I don't, it's a debate. But. So let, let me ask you a question. How do we overcome temptation? By addressing that there's desires in us that are not of God, right? Right? Becoming honest, or as God said to Abraham, becoming blameless before him. See, blameless is not saying that you're perfect. Blameless is saying, I'm going to take ownership of the things that are not of God and hold myself accountable before him so that he can search me and then show me what needs to be dealt with so that I may be able to choose that which is him rather that, than that which is me. Amen. Amen, John. Good word. Thank you. So they had two trees, represents a choice, represents freedom. Have you ever asked yourself, why did God present the option for choice? Why didn't he just program you to say, God, I love you, whether you wanted to or not? It's not love, right? If I held a gun up to Dino's head and I said, Dino, tell me you love me right now. Is that love? No, that's coercion. Right? So God made us like him. He gave us the ability to choose to present the opportunity for love. Where there is no freedom, there is no love. Let me say that again. Where there is no freedom, there is no love. You guys good? It's too much, too fast. Where there is no freedom, 
There is no love. So the ability for you to choose God or not choose God creates the capacity for you to love him. Without a, cho without a choice, you're just being coerced. You're being controlled. What does the enemy want to do in our lives? He wants to control us. What does God want from us? Love, freedom. In order for us to love him, we must be free. But this is what's amazing about the, the perfect triune God is that he's not intimidated by what you choose because he's already made his choice. Here's what's really cool. God is sovereign, but he's not in control of your life. <laughs> Think about that for a second. What does that mean to be sovereign? It means that when he chooses something, you can't change his mind, right? It means that if he, when he decides to open the last scroll and for Jesus to come back, there's nothing you can do to stop that. You can't get in his way, but he's not going to make your choices for you because he doesn't desire to control you. He desires that you would be free so that you could make that choice for yourself so that you would learn how to love God. <laughs> Amen. Okay. So there's two trees. Satan comes in and reveals that Eve has a desire within her that is not good, is not of God, but because Eve doesn't have this great teaching to help her, she makes the first terrible choice ever recorded in human history. She eats the apple. What happens after that? Her eyes are open, and she realizes, oh, no, we're naked. Adam eats it. We're, we're naked. Let me ask you a question. Were they naked before they ate the apple? Right. Yeah. So what's changed? Their choice, the wisdom, their choice has changed everything. In that choice, they decided that they would come out of the covering of God's protection, safety, provision, love, grace, and that they would step in to their own protection, their own wisdom, their own grace. See, this is what sin is, is doing in our lives. We think, well, it just it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. I'm just doing this every once in a while. Nobody really knows, so it doesn't matter. There's a spiritual impact in your life through the door opening of sin. The first ministry you have is to yourself. Amen? To deal with the things in you that don't look like God. Until you make that choice, everything else will be a burden in your life. That do, again, that's not saying you need to be perfect or you need to have it all together. That's just saying you need to be accountable to what God has expected out of you. Amen? Amen? Where were we? So they make the choice. They can now see that they're weak, fragile human beings who never had the ability to care for themselves because that's not how we're designed. We're designed to be cared for by God. They now see how weak and, and insignificant they are, and they become ashamed of themselves. See, the result of sin is always shame because now your eyes are not on who God is but what you can do. It's not very good. I'm, I'm sorry to inform you. You're not enough. You were, you were designed to be in relationship with God. Therefore, outside of relationship with him, you're inadequate. Okay, good word, John. Thanks, guys. <laughs> See, the ability to choose relationship with him is the same narrative all throughout Scripture. Think about when Egypt or when Israel is delivered out of Egypt, where does God lead them? To, to the, well, before that, to the Red Sea, right? Takes them to the Red Sea, and they have to make the choice. What's the choice? To trust God's provision, to trust God's safety, his, his, his uh, leadership, and cross, or out of fear and the, the unwillingness to come out of themselves, go back to Egypt, right? Think about Peter when he's invited by Jesus to walk on water. He's got a choice. He can either trust himself, stay in the boat, do what makes sense, or he can get out of the water, step into the storm, step on the water, and go where Jesus has led him to do. It's a choice. Right? Of course, now Peter fell through the water, but I think it's pretty impressive that he took any steps on top of water. Probably more than I would ever be able to do. God calls Abraham to sacrifice his son, but does he take his hand from heaven, grab Isaac and Abraham, lift them up the mountain, and place them both on the altar? No, he has to make the choice to do the work of being obedient to God. Amen? <laughs> That's probably a pretty bad day for them. So, 
maybe, just maybe, just maybe, the hard things in your life that you can't control, the things that don't work out in your favor are not a result of God not loving you. Maybe it's because you've chose something other than being obedient to him. And we'll just settle that in there. Let your heart rest. He still loves you. He's made his choice. But maybe things not working out the way you want them to work out has very little to do with God's will and a whole lot to do with you being dominated by your own sin will. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Verse 8 in Genesis 3. Then when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked, the Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. This is the second biggest mistake made in recorded human history. He blamed his wife. <laughs> it really is. It really is the second worst mistake made in human history. Not only did they run from God, but they refused to take ownership for their own sin. Right? God actually is presenting them an opportunity to, to repent, to confess. You know, you, we didn't need to do that. We shouldn't have done it, Lord. We, we choose you instead of ourselves. I think God's grace would have filled in the gap, but instead they both pass the buck on, right? They do. So let me point out to you for a second that they've broken relationship with God. That's why God can't see where they are, right? He doesn't control us. He's not got like an Apple air tag attached to our foot and like he's just following us and tracking us. He's in your life if you're letting him in your life. So they break relationship with him. But has God's choice for them changed? No, because he chases after them. Right? And this is the parable of, of the prodigal son in Luke. The father's heart has not changed even though you've decided you don't need him. And so God goes chasing after his son and his daughter because when the breeze comes, the, the refreshment of the Holy Spirit comes in, I bet Adam and Eve would run into that going, ah, oh, Papa, we love you. But this time they didn't. And so he goes looking for them. And then they say, no, you know, we, we, we hid from you because we see who we really are. And God goes, who told you who you really are? You've always been that way, and I've always loved you. It never made a difference that you were naked. I always had perfect relationship with you. Why did you choose yourself over my care, my protection, my safety, my covering? And, of course, they begin to blame each other. And then it finally, uh, you know, it says there that Eve says, the snake made me do it. I want to tell you, the devil is not your biggest problem. You're your biggest problem. He's defeated. He's been publicly humiliated before all of eternity. Forever he will be 0 and 1. So if you can confess, repent, and then take authority, he's always going to lose in regard to your life. But you have to get over yourself. And you have to understand that God has already chosen to get over who you are because he's chosen to love you. So now you have to make the same choice to say, Lord, I'm not perfect. I am broken. I do make mistakes. Often I don't choose you, but I repent and I turn and I take authority over the enemy's attack in my life and I choose you again. So we've answered our second question. God has chosen us, right? He chases after them. We're going to keep developing the first. Verse 20, the man, Adam, named his wife Eve, which I don't recommend you name your wife, but that's what he did, because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Then the Lord God said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out and take the fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the garden 
of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay, so they have refused. They're still making a choice. This is how we know they're making a choice because they could take ownership, but they've chosen not to take ownership. So they're still choosing not to have relationship with God. Amen? And so God sees this and he goes, man, my heart's breaking. And he does something radical. He, 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 he makes a prophetic sign by killing an animal and then wrapping their bodies in its pelt. What is he doing there? He's prophetically saying, your choice doesn't, ma- doesn't change my choice, right? Because he has to slaughter an innocent animal, spill its blood, and then wrap their brokenness, their humanity, in its protection. This is a picture of Jesus that, God, that the Lord, the Father God is saying over them, as they choose themselves over him, although you don't choose me, I choose you, and one day I'm going to come for you in the form of, of a man, my son Jesus, the spotless lamb, he's going to be slaughtered on your behalf. His blood is going to be spilled, and then you're going to be wrapped in his robes of righteousness, right? He's declaring right now that your choice doesn't change my mind. And then it says that he banishes them from the garden. And how many of you hear that and go, boy, that doesn't seem loving to send them away from something they're made for. But if you look deeper in the text, it says that before he banishes them, in verse 22, the Lord said, look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil, what if they reach out and take the fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So is God saying he wants them to die? No, they're already dead. As soon as they ate the fruit, they died. Their spirits uh, stopped communing with God's spirit. So what he's saying here, remember, there's two trees in the garden. There's the tree of life, which gives them eternal life so they can live forever on the earth, and the tree of good, of tree of evil and knowledge. You got, you got the point. So he says, oh, no, if they have access to that tree, they forever will be stuck in their rebellion apart from me on the earth. Sometimes God takes away what we want because it's not good for us, not because he's mad at us, right? And this is what I want to say to you right now. There are things in your life that God has protected you from, that you really wanted, that you would have given anything for, but he took from you, not because he was angry, not because he doesn't approve of you, not because he doesn't love you, but because he only wants the best for your life. And you have to do the work of reconciling your mind to say, no, 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 my God is good. He has a good future. He has a good future for me. He has a good plan for my life. And if he didn't give it to me today, maybe I'm not ready for it, but he's going to give me something better tomorrow. So he was protecting them from being in rebellion to him for the remainder of eternity. And eternity is a long time, so that's a good thing. So let me ask you a question. Did Adam and Eve's choice change God's choice? No. Uh -uh. Go go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. This pretty much sums it up. This is uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. And he says this, even before he made the world, God loved us. So as you were in an idea in his head, he loves you and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. It's important you understand that this gives God pleasure, that you understand that he's chosen you, that he loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's profound. It really is, because before you existed... Before creation existed, Father, Son, Holy Spirit were enough pleasure for themselves. But then the thought of you came and your life and all the plans God had for you. And he said, oh, man, I can't wait till this happens. And he created you. And then you made a choice not to love him, but it didn't change his mind about who he thinks you are. And so he sent his son Jesus so that he could come to you. 
and show you his mighty love so that you could go into Jesus and then come to him and say, Abba, I love you. Daddy, thank you for this life you've given me. You've renewed me by your blood. <laughs> this is the gospel. So you are predestined. God has made a choice, but his choice is to prosper you. His choice is to make you extremely fruitful. His choice is to love you. And until you start believing that, you're going to be walking through mud your entire life. You've got to believe God's choice for your life, not your circumstances. So this verse 6, this is our response. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom. See, before you were in Christ, you were a slave to Satan. You didn't know how to choose. But now in Christ, you have conviction. So your choices are illuminated to you. <laughs> Come on. With the blood of his son and forgave our sins, he has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. So this is why it's important that you understand his choice. He doesn't want you to walk in the darkness. He doesn't want you to like walk around the earth going, boy, I hope God really loves me. Boy, I hope everything works out the way I want it to work out. Oh man, I'm just, I just don't know. It's just things in my past and all the people around me and my expectations. No, he wants you in all wisdom and all understanding to live faithfully saying, God, you've chosen to prosper me. You want to make me exceedingly fruitful. The things in my life, they don't really make sense, but I know this one thing to be true, and it is the fullness of wisdom that you've chosen me. You love me. You have a plan for me. You desire me. It brings you great pleasure to see me do the things you've called me to do. But you've got to make a choice. Are you going to believe what God has decided or are you going to believe what you see? <laughs> you going to believe what you feel? Are you going to let your experiences rewrite who you're supposed to live like? Are you going to allow your expectations to rob you of what you're supposed to be doing? Really, the choice is yours. The choice is yours. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you made a choice before the foundations of this world, Lord. You made a choice, and your choice is to love us, to free us. Your choice is to give us all wisdom, all understanding. Your choice is to prosper us, to make us exceedingly fruitful. Your choice is to empower us, to grace us, to give us your authority. Your choice is to love us as your very own son was loved by you, your choice is that we would know you intimately. So Father, because of that, we praise your name. We say, God, thank you for being a perfect father. Thank you for being a daddy who cares. Thank you for, for, for protecting me from the things that I want that don't have my best interests. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving me before I ever knew you. So if you're in here and you've, you've just, you feel like God has not given you his best. There goes the bass. You feel like God has not given you his best. You feel like you've always had to settle. I believe he wants to break that <laughs> off of you right now. And I want you to come up and just receive ministry. In Jesus' name, amen.